Welcome everyone to April's ECR Wednesday webinar hosted by eLife, the series that aims to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. We hope we, fi we find you well listening at home um, and today our speakers will discuss how early career researchers can improve training and research quality within your institutions. Uh, this webinar will begin with the panelists sharing their stories and in the second half of the webinar we'll be putting your questions to them. To ask a question, you can type in the question box on GoToWebinar, or you can tweet us at eLife Community using the hashtag ECR Wednesday, um, using that hashtag. Uh, finally, I'd just like to let you know that we are recording this webinar and we'll make it available on YouTube in the near future. Um, your chair today is Vinod Ilangovan, and I'm gonna hand over to you right now. Over to Vinod. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for our Early Career Researchers Wednesday webinar, uh, discussing how ECRs can improve training and research quality at the institutions. Um, my name is Benot Elangoven, and I'm a member of the Early Career Advisory Group at eLife, and I'll be moderating today's uh, webinar. Um, so just a quick word about um, our host of today, eLife. Uh, eLife is a nonprofit organization that is operating a platform to improve all aspects of research communication uh, by encouraging and recognizing the most uh, responsible behaviors in research. Um, the role of early career advisory group uh, or uh, the picture that you saw before, uh, is uh, to influence and support eLife's work to catalyze a broad reform in the evaluation and communication of science, um, and in particular, uh, to represent the needs and aspirations of researchers at early stages in their careers for a research culture that is healthy both for science and for scientists. Uh, this webinar series, uh, Early Career Researcher Wednesday, is one of such initiative that eLife has launched to help support uh, the ECR community. Um, I'd like to welcome our three speakers uh, we have with us today. Uh, Verena Heiser from University of Oxford, uh, Sophia Cruvel uh, from uh, Charité Medical University Berlin, and Peter Grabitz uh, from Berlin Institute of Health Press Center. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, and um, I'd like to start or give a uh, background to this uh, webinar in particular of the topic that we'll be discussing for the next hour. Um, so imagine if you have the immense power to improve the research culture in your institutions uh, as an early career researcher, not as a leader of the institute, um, that will actually empower you. So uh, for the next hour or so, the speakers will inspire and empower you uh, by discussing how early career researchers can influence and improve the research quality and research culture, both at institutional level locally and also globally. Um, so I'd like to, uh, before we open up the floor for speakers, I'd like to let you know, uh, you can follow us on Twitter at ELAF community with the hashtag ECI Wednesday. And you can also ask uh, a question using the GoToWebinar question box uh, or uh, at uh, eLife. Um, or at eLife Community Twitter using ECI Wednesday hashtag. Um, I'd also like to remind you uh, that we have some uh, expectations or community participation guidelines uh, that uh, we request everyone to be respectful, honest, and inclusive, um, and accommodating, appreciative, and open to learn from everyone. And um, in general, do not attack, demean, uh, disrupt, uh, harass, or threaten others, or encourage such behavior. If you feel uncomfortable or unwelcome uh, in any of these webinars, uh, so please uh, contact eLife by email uh, to events at elifesciences.org. Uh, this inbox is uh, being watched by Anya Stas at eLife, who is also working uh, or supporting us uh, from behind the scenes, along with Naomi Penfold. Um, and we also reserve the right to ask anyone to leave or deny subsequent access to the future webinars. Um, so uh, please uh, contact us if you need any help. Uh, now I'd like to open the floor for speakers. Uh, first up is um, Verena Heise. Uh, she's an intermediate fellow at uh, Newfield Department of uh, Population Health at the University of Oxford. Uh, she does a lot of interesting things, including uh, co-organizing Berlin Oxford Summer School, and uh, she had uh, used Open Science Framework um, as a platform to uh, share her presentations about open and reproducible research. Um, so now I'd like to invite Verena to talk about uh, her initiatives um, and um, yeah, enlighten us about how uh, we can organize ECR uh, activities uh, that are not 
you know, uh, only limited to publishing. Verena, please. Great, thank you, Vinod, for the introduction. Yeah, I'll try and to inspire and um, enlighten everyone. So let's see how that goes. Um, I'll basically talk about my experience uh, over the last three years in getting early career researchers um, really to change their sort of environment, change their own research. And uh, a lot of this is from my, from, from my own background, but also um, a couple of things come from things that uh, others have done in, in Oxford mostly. And I hope it's going to be interesting and um, to, to others. And if you're, uh, you can download my slides if you're interested um, from the OSF. Uh, and you, you're also very welcome to email me. You know, either ask questions um, later or email me directly if you're interested uh, in taking any of this further. So this is just my sort of disclosure form uh, because I think it's uh, a good practice, but also to say that I'm actually leaving Oxford relatively soon. Um, I'll be based uh, at the Hansa Wissenschaftskolleg relatively soon in Germany um, to work on a meta research project, which I think is very exciting because at the moment my own research doesn't have anything to do uh, with the sort of science policy stuff that I'm involved um, in at the moment. Uh, and so I'm very excited uh, to, to take this next step. And this is also to show you that I'm super biased. I think there's a lot of stuff that we need to do uh, to do research improvement, and I work with a lot of different organizations to get stuff done. So I'll, uh, I, I can talk about, you know, an hour uh, for, for an hour uh, about what the problem actually is that I think we're facing. Um, but I guess I, I just wanted to show you one slide that I think illustrates the problem quite nicely. So I guess most of us will be aware that we have a reproducibility or replication crisis in lots of different fields uh, in psychology, um, cancer biology or social sciences. We have a number of different uh, papers that actually um, sort of give us some numbers to show that this is the case. Um, and I think we, we all can we can probably all agree on the fact that uh, we seem to be, have problems with the quality of the research that we produce. It doesn't seem to be as reproducible or replicable as we would like. So the question is, uh, what kind of what, what can we actually do to improve uh, the quality of our own research, but also of the community in general? And so I've sort of uh, for this talk, I decided to come up with a wish list for research improvement in a number of different um, areas, and I'll just go through them in turn. Uh, and um, I I will show lots of stuff on the slides, but uh, I won't go into much detail. I think uh, we can uh, discuss the more interesting uh, things later on in the Q and A. So first of all, uh, is training. I think training is, is such an important, uh, plays such an important part here. I think we are not necessarily taught as much as we should be about research methods. And this is across the whole cycle of a research project from how you develop your hypotheses to publishing sort of uh, your, your results in the end. Uh, and this is not just about good research practice, but I think it's good research practice in combination with open uh, research, um, uh, to use the slightly broader term than open science. Um, and this is about opening up your processes so that other people can see your data, see your uh, materials and methods. Um, and I think this is uh, just a, a way to be um, more reproducible is by, by really sharing the different parts of your research um, in addition to your finished manuscript. Then when it comes to infrastructure, um, you know, we can train people as much as we like. If we don't have the infrastructure in place to be able to share, for example, our data, then nothing is ever going to change. So we need the digital infrastructure. But we also need physical infrastructure, and this is infrastructure, for example, to share uh, reagents um, or other materials like cell lines. But we also need ethical and legal guidelines. And I think one of the things that would make a huge difference to people is actually having good help desk systems, where you, for example, have a study help desk. Um, you can talk to someone while you're designing your study um, who actually knows how to run experiments properly and for, who knows a bit about stats and how you might want to analyze the, the data afterwards. Um, who you can go to to just get some useful ideas from. But nothing's ever going to change if these incentives don't change. Um, so one of the things that really needs to change is how we hire and, and promote people. This shouldn't just be based on the quantity of publications you have or the impact factor of the journal that you publish in. Um, and uh, a lot of institutions, at least in the UK, have now signed up to DORA, uh, which basically states that um, impact factor of the uh, journal that you published in will not be used in assessment procedures anymore. Um, but basically how this is going to be implemented is actually a big question mark. And I think when it comes to incentives, we also need to talk about working conditions. Uh, and one of the things that I'm uh, very keen on promoting is that we need to think about stuff like contract length, for example. Um, I think it's ridiculous to expect from a, an early career researcher that they do a high quality research project on a one year contract, for example. So I think we also need to, to talk about working conditions when it comes to research improvement. The other question is about meta-research. I think we need a relatively good evidence base to understand the problems that we're facing. 
um, and also whether the proposed solutions are actually working. And I think this is a relatively sort of new field that's developing at the moment. And uh, for people like me who are now starting in this field, actually it's relatively hard to find um, the right place to, to go uh, because lots of uh, institutions don't even have departments for this kind of work. So I think that there's actually a huge space for institutions to get um, involved in uh, developing meta research communities. And then in the end, it's about changing culture. Um, I'm, I'm a person who, who firmly believes that equality, diversity and inclusivity need really to be at the heart of what we're trying to achieve here. I think everyone needs to have a, a, a space at the table. And this is not just about gender and um, ethnicity. I think it's also about seniority. And um, this is where I come from when I say early career researchers need to have a, a, a seat at the table where we make discu discussions and decisions about how um, we're changing uh, culture nowadays. And so I just wanted to go through a couple of examples, uh, mostly from Oxford, of the things that we've done, basically so that people can get an idea of what you can uh, do as an early career researcher, even if you don't have any uh, or don't have a lot of support, be that from your PI or from your department. And so these are just a couple of training examples. So, uh, And this is not um, stuff that I, I haven't necessarily been involved in uh, in all of these, um, but these are examples from, um, from my work and from others in, in Oxford. So people have uh, set up seminar series or, or journal clubs, and this is what Sophia is going to talk about in much more detail later. Um, we've uh, run software da data carpentry workshops, uh, one-day reproducibility schools where we basically got lots of speakers together to talk about reproducibility and uh, and how to improve reproducibility. Uh, and then the sort of um, longest event that we've run uh, in terms of training was really the Berlin Oxford Summer School, which is a five-day event and uh, sort of shameless uh, advertising here. Um, we're going to run the Oxford Berlin Summer School this year again. Um, it's uh, probably not going to take uh, place in Berlin because uh, of the current situation. It's probably going to be virtual. Uh, but if anyone wants to apply, the, uh, you can do that uh, until the end of uh, May. Um, but there are also uh, examples of where people have built their own infra infrastructure for, uh, for their labs. So this is a, a great example from a good colleague of mine. Um, who has uh, spent a lot of time trying to develop infrastructure for her own lab, um, where they now have, for example, standard oper operating procedures so that every person who comes into the, uh, into the lab actually knows how to do things and, and can read up on things, um, in addition to obviously being able to ask uh, the people around you to help you. Uh, and others have uh, gotten really interested in meta research, and this is uh, just another example from Oxford, um, where people have uh, gotten together to do a meta research project that they were interested in and it was um, a research that they didn't uh, do as part of um, what their job actually is but it's something they did on the side simply because they were interested and i think this is a relatively common theme here that a lot of people just um, got really excited about uh, different aspects of improving research culture um, and basically just went on and, and did it and i think we all realize that we can't do it on, on our own i think we can't change culture on our own so it's uh, for us, I think what we realized over the years is that we really need to get together. And this is how uh, Reproducible Research Oxford developed um, out of all these different initiatives. When we sort of um, formed our sort of core group, uh, we, we are now um, expanding massively into lots of different departments, in lo into lots of different divisions. And I think one of the most rewarding experiences has been uh, that we actually get people from social sciences, from humanities, from across the board. Um, involved in this and we realize that uh, a lot of different areas have problems um, with research quality but I think the solutions are actually relatively similar uh, at least in some uh, areas and the great thing is that we now got funding for a coordinator it's a full-time post and so we, we we can now take this forward really well in, in Oxford and I think it's been amazing to see how this has developed over the last years and we are the local network of the UK reproducibility network which is really a, a group of um, amazing people who are trying to ensure coordination of the efforts across the sector, because really what needs to do is needs to happen is really the whole system needs to change. And, you know, yes, while we can change our own practices as early career researchers, um, I think what needs to change is how institutions um, view what we're doing, how funders um, give us uh, grants and all these different parts of the scientific ecosystem need to get together um, to really think about research improvement at the uh, broad level. And why do I firmly believe that early career researchers need to be at that table? Um, well, I, th I think what we have to offer uh, is three things, but I think there are, there are more, but maybe it boils down to three things. One is passion. 
uh, I think a lot of us are really, really keen on changing things um, and uh, are developing really amazing ideas um, for, for doing that. But we also developed lots of expertise over the last couple of years and, and we're actually at the forefront of this because we have to implement the solutions. So we have the expertise to make things happen. Uh, and time, and uh, by that I don't mean that we have too much time on our hands. I don't think any of us do. Um, I think we're all totally overwhelmed because we're tending to work 24 seven anyway. Uh, but what I mean is that we don't have um, additional activities like administrating a lab group, for example. So in contrast to PIs, um, if people actually give us a bit of um, time to develop solutions, we can actually do this uh, much more efficiently. And then we can share expertise in our labs, we can run training activities, and I think we're all really keen on sharing ideas around infrastructure and other um, things that I've talked about, uh, because I think this is where we are at the forefront of, of making changes. And the only thing that we need is really some job security, and I'm not even talking about permanent posts here. I think what I'm talking about is that um, these activities that I was talking about, that you arrange training activities, for example, but this can be an official part of your job. Um, I've done that on the side, and uh, it's been sort of really eating up my life. Um, and so we really just need a bit of job security. We just need to make this part of our jobs. Uh, we need a tiny bit of money, um, and this is just really to run training activities. I'm not talking about salaries here. And a bit of support, uh, be that from your PI or from you know, department heads or even from institutional heads, I think would be great uh, and incredibly helpful. And I think we're, we are starting to get there uh, at Oxford, certainly, and I think lots of other institutions are waking up to the fact that they need to do something about the, the quality of the research that's produced there. So what can you do as, as an early career researcher? I think the first thing to do is maybe try and find training opportunities, and I've just put up some um, uh, on, on, this, on the slide here. Develop your own infrastructure, and this could be just infrastructure for your own uh, project. It doesn't have to be for your whole lab, but it just has to be for your project. I think um, learning things like a good data management practice is just brilliant um, for yourself as a, as a researcher. Um, and will will uh, will be beneficial to your sort of future career definitely. Then the the other thing that I think really makes a difference is if if you manage to find like-minded people and manage to ra raise awareness around the issues of research improvement by running events. Uh, and I think this is what we've seen in Oxford is um, that when you're working on your own and you you think you're the only person in the world who cares about this, it can get very lonely. But as soon as you um, develop some activities and realize, hey, I'm not the only crazy person out there uh, who's interested in this, I think it can be very exciting and very empowering. And then if you want to go crazy, yes, you can start to lobby your PI, you can uh, start to lobby your department. Um, and uh, if these are things that you're interested in, then by all means, do email me to, to ask more questions. Uh, and I've put together sort of a, a short document with some tips on what you might want to achieve. This is not polished at all. It's not published anywhere. You can just go to the OSF and have a look. At, I, I think it's better than nothing. Um, so have a look at this if you're interested. So really just to say thank you to all the people that I work with. I'm sure I've uh, missed out some. Uh, and so yeah, thanks to, to all the people who, who are supporting what we're doing. Uh, and thanks for your attention. If you want to get in touch, here's my email address and you can find my slides on the OSF. Thank you. Thank you, Verena. Uh, that was more than inspiring. You actually hit the nail or hit the hammer on the nail. Uh, thanks for that. Um, up next is um, Sophia Kruvel. Um, so Sophia is a PhD candidate uh, at the Meta Research Innovation Center, uh, Charité Medical University, Berlin. And she's also a co-founder of the Reproducibility Journal Club, um, which is a movement um, which she'll talk about, uh, which now has over 70 groups around the world, if I'm not wrong. Um, and she's going to actually tell us how we can transform your frustration into action um, and you know, change things using um, you know, initiatives like journal clubs. Uh, Sophia, please. Thanks. Um, OK, just God, why do I feel like an old person? Um, <laughs> all right. Um, yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, so Verena has already um, sort of introduced some of this, uh, I guess, at the side. So I'll be talking about Reproducibility, um, which is uh, an international and ECR-led journal club series. Um, oh. All right, what is it? Right, as I said, it's a journal club initiative and a podcast, um, which is very much grassroots. So when we started this, um, it was 
Amy, Sam and I um, at Oxford, we were kind of a little bit frustrated maybe, or we were um, hoping to have um, more space for discussions surrounding open and reproducible science um, and more sort of power behind those, those, those discussions as well. And so we just put together a reading list for a first term, so for eight weeks, um, and got started with this relatively um, quickly um, because it turns out if, if you're just meeting and drinking tea and eating cookies, no one can really stop you doing that. Um, now the core team that we have is um, still the three of us and then um, Matt Jackery, Katie Drax and Jade Pickering, just to make sure that I've, I've mentioned these lovely people um, who make up the core reputability team now. And of course, all the local journal club leads uh, without which uh, without who none of this uh, would work because it's now actually quite a big uh, community. Um, the main idea behind this, obviously it's a journal club, right? So technically it's, mo it's about uh, reading papers together and discussing them and learning things from them. And that is the case, right? You are exchanging ideas um, with other uh, like-minded people um, and you are having quite interesting discussions. But at the core of it, I think this is about um, building a community um, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit more later. As I said, it's turned into an international organization. It's actually more than just 70, uh, more than 70 institutions now. It's 88 institutions in 20 different countries across the world, which is a bit mad. Uh, so this is an older map actually, because the, the, I, I haven't been able to make, make the new one work in the way that I wanted to. Um, but yeah, so just, it's all a bit mad. Um, and we've got a lot, we've got a, a huge community across the world, which is really, really nice because you get um, to hear so many interesting stories as well. Um, we are funded currently by the UKRN. Um, so Lena has also mentioned that, the UK Reproducibility Network. Um, yeah, so you can find those, uh, you can find them at UK Repro uh, or UKRN.org. Um, right, so I've told you very vaguely what this is. Why should you, well, why, why do I think that you should host uh, or join a journal club um, in, any, in any case or a reproducibility one in particular? Um, so yeah, as I said, you can read interesting papers, you can learn more about the interesting ideas and skills surrounding um, open and reproducible science together with people um, of sort of your career stage mostly. Um, yeah, so you do that with these interesting people, key part. And then thereby you kind of, without really even really realizing, you create a community um, around these issues, um, a community that can help each other. Um, so that's kind of basic idea. Um, main aspect, supposedly, the papers. Um, a lot of the uh, Reputability Journal Clubs start with a common reading list that we put together for 24 weeks in total. Um, but they're kind of largely focused on sort of psychology, social science um, topics. We're in the process of um, creating uh, different reading, uh, reading lists for, um, for different areas as well, because it's, uh, while it started in a psychology context, this has spread uh, beyond that. Um, and then after sort of a, a couple of common papers, um, journal clubs mostly move on to a mix of um, again, so these, these papers mostly surround, um, mostly focused on open and reproducible science and papers that are um, more relevant to specifically their area, um, either in either also focusing on open science um, or even just um, just any paper um, and discussing them, th those papers um, with that kind of lens of uh, open science and reproducibility. The goals of this are, of course, to learn more about open and reproducible science. Um, kind of in a space where you don't have that pushback um, or that potential for pushback from above or well, above, you know, uh, above in, in a seniority kind of sense, I guess. Um, and uh, ideally, uh, you can also use these journal clubs to um, sort of through criticizing um, the papers that you're reading, be that the, the open science papers, which aren't um, sort of and um, completely, uh, like you can still criticize them just because they're focused on open science doesn't mean they're perfect. They're not because it's it's still uh, research done by humans um, and, and sort of the, the journal papers that you might be reading. Um, and by criticizing that, that research um, or just re-engaging really with it, um, you, I find you also often learn 
a lot about how to do better research yourself. Um, and then, of course, you know, outside of the papers that actually just basically teach you new skills um, or new things to to care about, kind of thing. And as always, you're forming a community um, of kind of visible proponents of these ideas, um, making like you and a whole group of people, uh, turning you and a whole group of people into these kind of experts potentially um, in in your larger community, which can be really powerful. Community. Um, which I, as I said, I think is actually the main aspect of reproducibility. Uh, it's a kind of Trojan horse where like, here's knowledge and actually you end up with friends and uh, and support and a platform for change. Uh, as I said, we first got started um, out of a frustration, like with reproducibility out of a frustration with the status quo, with um, the way uh, that, that sort of, yeah, that these, these, these issues might maybe were being discussed um, with science. Um, as I also said, it was super easy to set up for us um, and very effectively, or efficiently um, transformed our frustrations into um, a community, um, into a platform for change. Um, it's now even easier because we created this artifact. I think that I think that is helpful. Um, and yeah, what you end up with is a visi visible local community. Um, of at least your local journal club, but ideally also extensions of that, including potentially even your lab, um, because you might, by being more visible, you might end up um, even convincing people that you didn't think were sort of convincible. That's a word. Um, and on top of that local community that you can see quite easily, um, it's sort of because you're creating it, I guess, with the people that, that join you. You're also joining a global community. Um, you're joining that um, via Twitter, which, which is big. Um, and uh, as sort of, we've got a reproducibility Slack, mostly for the organizers, um, but also more generally. And um, in, initially, originally there was a, uh, there were plans for a big meeting, um, an in-person meeting later this year, actually next month, which is now online. But yeah, basically you, you end up with a whole like a whole host of communities um to support you um and to make you feel like you're not the only one thinking about these issues caring about these issues which i personally have found so unbelievably helpful um but so that you don't have to just take my word for it here are some quotes um kindly collected by jade um i'll just read some of this um so the, the question was, what does reproducibility mean to you? Um, someone said, it's been a brilliant chance for me to try building a community in the workplace with amazing support. Um, someone else values it because, it, again, the so social support, the collaborative opportunities that came out of this, and the knowledge ex exchange. Um, I like that it allows people to designate some time in their schedule for thinking about the big, uncomfortable questions that might be making most of the rest of their schedule obsolete, but hopefully just means they can do better work. Sorry, this sounds like an advertisement, but I just, I enjoy these. Um, and it's showing departments that ECRs want to be a part of a big change, even if there's no university leadership yet. We are the change that is needed in research practice and culture. <laughs> um, now, um, yeah, well, first, as, as I said, you can start one, your start a journal club yourself. Uh, we've got the starter pack, which I'm linking to later as well. Uh, but currently, because of, the general global situation, you can actually just join an existing reproducibility um, journal club um, online because lots of journal clubs have moved um, their meetings online instead of just canceling them because, you know, we still need to uh, clean up science and um, learn more about uh, these important skills surrounding open and robust science. And so we've put together um, a calendar, first of all, uh, with the reproducibility um, journal clubs that are opening their online meetings to a wider participation, not usually just the link. You do have to email someone, that's the threshold. Um, and then you can sort of join these discussions. Um, there's um, not a ton on here right now, but a couple are happening um, and it's quite interesting. Um, and sort of to go with that, uh, we also have some tips both for attending um, and for hosting a reproducibility online journal club. Um, you could even actually just start your journal club remotely, which probably um, 
minimizes that potential for pushback even more um, than just starting a journal club at any other time. But yeah, that's it. Um, my, that's my sort of broad introduction to reproducibility. I've got some uh, general links uh, here and um, uh, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you, Sophia, for, for sharing your wonderful thoughts on this. Um, so now uh, we can move on to our final panelist um, and uh, you know, uh, Peter Gravitz. He's a research fellow at the Berlin Institute of Health uh, Quest Center, uh, which is an uh, institution that runs projects on reproducibility and openness of biomedical research. Um, Peter, uh, during his medical studies, actually co-organized a community of students that campaigned for better conflict of interest policies on campus. Um, and uh, that um, kind of bottom-up campaigning you know, changed into top-down regulation for uh, conflict of interest uh, policies. So he'll talk about that. Uh, so I'll invite Peter now, please. Awesome, can you hear me? I hope so. Hold on. Here we go. Great, thanks, thanks, Vinod, for uh, the kind introduction. Um, I'll be talking about conflict of interest policies at German uh, medical schools and what we've done there. Um, just one note on my own interests. As Vinod said, I'm a research fellow at um, the BIH Quest Center. I'm also a member of universities allied for essential medicines and METSIS IFA, which is a no free lunch group, and I occasionally consult for Site Inc. How did this all start? Um, effectively, it was a couple of years back um, when I was still at medical school, and I started attending my first scientific conferences. And I saw the very same professors um, giving talks at these conferences as they would at university. However, one thing is uh, they were talking a lot shorter, not longer than 10 minutes, that was good. Um, and also they, they did one other thing in a different way. They showed a second slide disclosing uh, additional sources um, of money, for example. And it made me think for a second, hold on, in the past five years, they haven't done this. Why do they do it in their 10 minute talk right here? Um, for for a while, this this was just a uh -huh, weird moment. Um, but when I then entered into the clinical phase of um, of my studies and uh, did clinical rotations as well, I, I came across pharmaceutical representatives more and more often. There were little presents handed to me, and I started talking to some of my my colleagues um, who had really similar stories to tell um, of little gifts happening and contacts with industry. So we did. Um, I think what what a lot of people would do, um, we looked at the literature and um, did a journal club more or less, and we were surprised in finding out. In fact, we're not the only ones. 88% um, of students at German medical schools have received a gift from a pharmaceutical company or attended a sponsored event. So. Um, this is something that almost every medical student is confronted with. But we realized at the same time, wait, we never taught about different interests in, um, in, in medicine or in healthcare in general. Um, and this is where after, after having read the literature even more, we, we also realized there are solutions to this. Um, there, the, the data is all there. It has been shown that comprehensive gift policies uh, at medical schools that reduce um, gifts and also um, contact times with pharmaceutical representatives improve the prescription or prescribing behavior of residents at later times. So if this is clear, why is nothing happening? Um, and we decided to kick off a campaign um, to go out, outside of the, of, of the general club um, focus and um, start a campaign with three very student focused uh, goals. We can't tell, I mean, conflict of interest, it's a, it's a, it's not such an easy topic. People are usually, they really quickly get, um, feel, feel attacked, but that's not what this was all about. It, um, it was all about the students and us um, and getting the best education possible. Um, so we asked for a second slide. All the professors should show us a second slide. We asked for a part of the curriculum um, to, 
to talk about and touch upon interests in healthcare and different interests. And we ask for policies regulating conflicts of interest at medical schools. And if German by itself didn't uh, sound aggressive enough, we also added a now in all caps underneath it. We um, also ran a little study. Um, we thought in the beginning, oh, this is just going to take four months. It's uh, nothing more than a little survey to all deans of German medical schools asking, um, do you have any curricular teaching activities on conflict of interest? And do you have policies or parts of policies that regulate conflict of interest? Um, can you please send them to us? We thought, oh, this will be fast. In the end, it took us a year and a half. Um, and what we did is we um, also did a web search that um, in case we, we didn't get um, any responses from any of the deans and we rated all the policies that we received. Um, the results were pretty, as we kind of expected, um, they were pretty scarce. There were only two schools having parts of policies or one policy that would regulate the criteria we set up beforehand. Um, and they re received only 12 out of 26 maximum points. Um, my own university, Charité, it's mentioned there, um, got four out of 26 points. What we then did is we um, we talked, we started talking about this and um, we hosted a conference. We got people together in person in Berlin. This happened last October. Um, and um, talked about our results, talked, uh, shared our own stories, um, how we were um, dealing with with a lack of regulation or what our own experiences. And um, we were fortunate enough to also have um, parts of these studies uh, of our study covered in, in different press and na national press. Um, so that created a bit of a buzz. Um, but the question really is, so what? Um, did we change something? Did the culture at our uh, universities really change? Well, there is a small sign of success. Um, the Institut für Medizinische und Pharmazeutische Prüfungsfragen, so the body that actually sets up um, the questions for the final exam before becoming a medical doctor, they introduced an agenda item on interests and potential conflicts in interest in healthcare. So now it will be part of the major exams um, medical students need to take to become doctors. And if it's part of the exams, as all students know well, um, you probably need to learn about it beforehand. So um, that was uh, part of the success. Other than that, uh, and this is what we're doing now, as um, I've learned reproducibility does it as well, we meet online and strategize further, further because ultimately it's about um, talking to deans, um, calling in meetings, asking, hey, can we support somehow with setting up um, more teaching activities? Um, did you send out reminder emails that uh, professors should disclose their conflicts of interest? And also, um, this is what we want to do next. We are not the only ones um, doing studies like this. In the past, the US and France um, uh, have, have done rankings like this. And Belgium is at the moment doing it. There's a group in Italy, um, in, in Australia, and in, the, in, um, in Denmark, who are running similar rankings. And um, yeah, we can help you do this. And we've done this before. And we try to rank and uh, continue talking in the language of institutions to put them um, under pressure to change the culture we have, because that's what universities care about, rankings and um, students. Um, uh, thanks to everyone. We're on Twitter as well. Um, this is um, a map with all the different chapters of universities allied for essential medicines who supported the study. Um, and I'm looking forward to further questions.
Hi everyone, while we wait for Vinod to um, un unmute, I think we're having some audio issues over here, um, we can kick off the questioning. So um, amazing talks, all three of you. I mean, it's just so inspiring, inspiring to hear all those stories. We have um, a couple of questions that are already coming in from the audience. So I'm gonna start with those. I know Vinod had his own question as well, but the first question I can see here is from Murth Mampe. Um, do you think online platforms such as PubPeer where anyone can post critiques on published and unpublished papers anonymously are beneficial for reproducibility. Now, um, Sophia and Verena, you spoke specifically about reproducibility, so I wonder if one of you two could start this off. Verena, yeah. Do you need yeah, us I'm, to? I'm, yeah. No, I'm happy to go for it. Um, I, I mean, that's a very, very specific question. Um, not sure I'm, I'm the expert on PubPeers at all. I think um, what I'm not a big fan of is actually anonymous, anything that's anonymous. Um, if, if we're talking about anonymous criticism, I think that's actually really hard. I realize that it sometimes protects early career researchers because if you criticize people openly, um, that can be quite hard and difficult and sometimes detrimental to your career. At least that's how people perceive it. Um, but I think anonymous criticism in general is not necessarily helpful. Um, if you don't know where it's coming from, you know, what kind of background people have, it's really, really hard to to go for that. And on top of that, uh, I'm not sure if it was PubPeer or one of the other platforms that kind of work like this, but isn't it the case that you kind of, you have to have a certain number of publications to even be able to join this and to use it? No? I have no idea. I have no idea. I just don't know. Well, because I, I, I think it is, if, and if it's not for this, I mean, because like, it, 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 it doesn't make sense, right? Because you don't want just anyone to um, to suddenly, I don't know, say some say say something about like sort of like anti-vax things or something. Um, but on the other, like on the one hand, you know, that makes sense. On the other hand, it also means that it's actually not that helpful for ETRs, I guess, um, and might might end up, well, it's not, like, but it might end up like a sort like a sort of um, popularity contest, which you kind of have with these. On the open science framework there's a, there's a new feature where you can clap for paper for preprints right so it's like i'd rather have i'd rather have uh discussions like that than than, the, than sort of clapping for each other but yeah no i agree it's kind of it can be dangerous if it's anonymous um and in this in this particular case it doesn't even have the added advantage of being open to us peter do you have anything to add Mm, not really at this point. I, I just want to stress and uh, emphasize what Sophia already said. I think it's uh, important that there shouldn't be a barrier for for criticizing or for critically appraising any research that's out there. So if you if you, there are journals, for example, that only accept your um, your viewpoint if you're at least um, having a, a PhD or a master's, um, while the content should matter, not uh, the person where it comes from. So if that was the case, that's um, that's a big downside. Oh, but I'm so unsure now. Maybe, maybe, maybe it wasn't pub peer. If it's not pub peer, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we might actually try to go to uh, Murph to unmute uh, in case there's anything else to add there. Um, but Murph does say um, that it, it, this question was indeed about the anonymous nature of the commenting. Have we had any luck getting to Murph? No, I think maybe maybe we can't. Oh no, here we go. Matt, can you hear us? Okay, we'll move we'll move along. Um, we have another comment from a listener who's not been able to stay for the Q and A, but just wanted to raise that. Um, uh, of course, within ECRs, we're including uh, lots of junior faculty as well. So you've got a lot of your postdocs taking action, but also people who are new PIs and. And, and actually it's quite a diverse mix of people in terms of career stage that we all lump together into ECRs and we've all got different ways to um, change the system. And every I know there's a lot of new PIs who are very keen to change the system as well. So that's uh, an excellent point. Um, there's a question here from Honor Pollard. Uh, what would you like to see from funders to help with reproducibility and research quality? Jump in, Sophia. Hmm? What wouldn't we like to see? Um... God, I mean, <laughs> probably um, an important part of this is uh, is actually rewarding um, 
open and robust science, um, or at the very least, not disincentivizing it actively, right? Because if you uh, if you're in a situation where you're sort of where you're trying to get grants and you and you know that you have to um, you essentially have to have published in certain journals to have the best um, chances chances at that lottery, uh, for example, and then you um, are doing a register report and putting lots and lots of work into it, but you actually only get one publication um, out of it, and you know that that sort of puts you in a bad position. That's that's not a great state, right? Like it's not great if uh, the if if someone who puts a lot of effort um, into um, creating a, a reproducible, um, a robust project um, has worse chances than someone who is focused on um, getting their uh, their research into um, as fancy a journal as possible. Um, so I guess that that's that's one big thing. Also, more money for meta research, of course. <laughs> well, I should have I should have had a uh, conflict of interest side as well, huh? But, uh, Verena have already has like all of the points to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I have lots of ideas of what funders could do. Um, I think the the most impactful thing that funders could do would actually be to have small grants for the kind of community building activities that we're doing. Um, you know, we, we've done most of this without funding. Um, we've been quite lucky in that we got uh, a number of different PIs who started to support us also with money. Um, but I think having small grants, and I'm talking about, you know, 10,000, 20,000 pounds, it doesn't have to be much, uh, that you can apply for and for which you don't have to be a PI. I think that's another bugbear that I have with a lot of uh, applications that you basically have to find a PI who fronts the application. And I think that's slightly ridiculous because the early career researchers are the ones who want to run this. Uh, and yes, you know, I don't have a permanent contract, but I tend to have a contract for another year or two. So uh, I can, you know, I'm, I'm going to use that year, that year or two, um, and I'm going to use up the funding during that year or two. So I think um, having to find a PI who fronts the applications, that's always driving me crazy. We might be going to Honor for some follow-up there. Honor, are you with us? I think it works now. Um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I think I'm unmuted. Thanks, guys. That was a great answer. Thanks, Honor. Vinod, back over to you. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead with the questions that was there. Uh, I was just able to join. Uh, sorry about this uh, bad uh, connection. Oh, yeah, no worries. Um, so there's no more questions in the questions box right now. So if you'd like to send them in on the questions box, please do. Um, particularly if you're interested in how you can make change in your institution and, and some of the tips that our presenters have shared have inspired you. Um, you can also put them on Twitter. In the meantime, Vinod, you had an excellent question for the speakers earlier that you shared. I want to. I wonder if you want to follow that up. Um, sure, I could. Um, so I'm just trying to pull up that question again. Um, yeah, let me see. I have it here if you'd like. Oh, oh, so yeah. Oh. It's something you've talked to a lot of us about already. Vinod's question is: um, there's there's a there's a quote from Akaya Windwood you can't sustain a movement if you don't sustain yourself. And what you've all talked about here today are efforts that have, have grown into much bigger efforts and I imagine are quite demanding. So how do you sustain yourself and your energy to build a movement against a lot of resistance? Okay. Do you wanna go first, Sophia? <laughs> I'll go, I'll go first. Um, all right, um, I have, use this word a lot already today, but community as always, right? It's just like, if you if you have if you have that community of people that you know is fighting for this as well, um, then you can, yeah, and it's quite easy to just, um, to reach out to them and um, uh, and get that support, the, the support that you need in difficult situations. Um, otherwise, of course, just like, just logging the, um, the sort of smaller successes that you do have along the way so that you can sort of look back at those if, if things are tough, but mainly community. It's just, um, that's, that's, that's why I think it's, uh, it's so important to create spaces um, where, you, where you have that support uh, to empower each other to create change. Thank you. Um, are there any more thoughts on that? 
I, I would like to directly add on onto this. I think um, in order to sustain yourself as a person, but also the, the movement you're trying to build, one needs to think about this from the very beginning. And it's not that easy. Um, I mean, as researchers, or as specific, specifically as early career researchers, we taught in Python and R, and some unlucky of us still Stata, but um, we're not taught about how to how to manage people or how to manage expectations or how to even build um, a community and maybe this can be connected with the question before what 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 are what am i looking for um from funders it's not it's necessarily money of course no one i mean setting up online platforms or infrastructure i don't want to pay for this out of pocket if coming having a community coming together but it, it's it's more also about the skills that are, are needed to um, sustain a, a movement or any effort. So I would I would love to get more um, more input on uh, maybe training on how to build communities, how to um, moderate, how to um, set expectations, etc. So this this could be something that that funders could step up and uh, and help help these little groups flourish. I'm also very happy to comment on that, actually. Um, first of that. all, yeah. so first of all, I think uh, I personally haven't actually run into a lot of resistance. Um, I think that's been really an interesting feature there, and it's something that maybe we can talk about as well. So I don't know how the others feel about this, but I think in the beginning, a lot of us were expecting resistance, and I think it hasn't been the case actually for most of us. I think um, the the barriers that you the, the most the biggest barrier that you get is people who are just simply not interested and you know especially people high up the food chain who are just not interested in what you have to say but i think this is slowly changing as well and i think a lot of uh, institutions um, a lot of pis are waking up to the fact that they need to do something the funders have woken up to that fact and i think the funders are actually pushing for change a lot i think this is one of the things that um, in the uk is happening a lot that the funders are actually the ones that are driving change and and uh, because they you know pour so much money into the system i think they have incredibly much power and they're using it in a good way uh, at least some of them are and so i think i haven't really run into a lot of resistance and i think the most important point is that you don't get hung up on um, areas where you either find resistance or where people are simply not interested i think i've realized that you know if you can't um, go one way, then you will always find some way around the obstacle. So, you know, don't go, you, you don't always have to go through the obstacle. Um, try and find another way. And I think this has been, um, I think this is one of the tips that I can sort of share with people here is that, you know, it doesn't really um, matter if, you know, the one person that you actually wanted to get um, to, to be behind you isn't behind you or you can't convince them. You know, there will always be another person um, who, who may be interested in this. And I think in terms of sustaining myself, I think this um, the journey has been really amazing over the last couple of years. And to see to see that this community um, is building, uh, to see that that so many people are getting involved in this has been incredibly rewarding. And I think it's uh, sometimes even more rewarding than sort of publishing your paper because you're like, yeah, you know, I, I did, did a bit of research and, you know, here's my paper in the end. Um, but actually to see to see that you're, you're part of something bigger um, can be incredibly re rewarding just by itself. Thank you for that nice thought. Um, so, I mean, this also kind of reminds me um, there are uh, three solutions to a problem, either accept it or change it or leave it. Uh, I mean, things that you cannot, you cannot accept, you need to change it. And things that you cannot probably change alone, you have to leave it to the community to solve it. Uh, so maybe on that note, I'd like to uh, ask your final closing comments um, from all of the panelists. And uh, before that, I, uh, since I didn't have the opportunity to thank Peter for his really visually engaging presentation, thank you, Peter, for that. And I also uh, like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the panelists for, of today to for sharing their uh, uh, insights into building a community initiative. Uh, so I'd now like to hear your um, final comments on um, or closing remarks on uh, what we can take from um, your initiatives and how we can build upon each other's work. Uh, would someone like to go first? 
I'm happy to go first if you want. Yeah. I think my my take home message is probably every little helps. You know, I think this is there's a big uh, supermarket in the um, in the UK that has this as a uh, tagline, and I think it's actually true. I think um, it it doesn't matter how small it is that you, you know make a change either in your own practice. You know, start with something small. St start with something. You don't have to change the world. You don't have to change every single practice um, in, in, for your research project. Start with something that actually works for you, that, that's actually you know, good for your project maybe, that something that you can convince your PI of, whatever that might be. Uh, and if this turns into something bigger, that's great, but actually it doesn't have to. I think we don't have to aspire to build a community. I, I think I never did, certainly. I'm not sure how the others feel about this. But sometimes you just, you know, you find a small problem, you want to change it, and um, suddenly it snowballs into something much bigger. And I think this is probably the situation that we've all found ourselves in. So, you know, every little help starts small. And if it turns into something bigger, great. Uh, and if it doesn't, you know, don't don't be disheartened. At least you change something on, on a small scale for yourself. Um, do you want to add on that, Sophia? Uh, no, I can, I can just, I can just go on. But I guess, like in, a, in some, in some way, I uh, then maybe disagree because I actually, I think the main thing is the importance of community. But just maybe not community. But maybe we don't. We probably don't. Uh, uh, we probably still agree with each other because it's. I, I guess I do see community as a, a much smaller unit as well. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Um, just yeah, look for the people uh, around you that you can create change with. Um, and yeah, I want to encourage people to um, sort of create spaces that work for them um, and that work for like their communities or the, the, the issues that they, they're, they're facing. Um, I personally found reproducibility um, and the reproducibility community incredibly helpful in navigating both sort of um, the challenges, the changes that are currently happening in science and the challenges that are thrown at you by academia and beyond. Um, and so I think if you can, claim that space at your institution um, and use it to help each other and to affect change. So yeah, community surprise. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, it's also good to have agreements on disagreements and that's fine. <laughs> uh, so Peter, uh, your final closing remarks? It's, it's hard to follow up on this and be the last one, um, but my attempt so would be on spot. <laughs> my attempt would go along the lines of um, universities specifically and a lot of institutions are about you. In our case, a medical school or uh, is only a medical school because of the students. Um, otherwise, it would be it would just be a hospital. Um, and you, your your opinion and your voice is super important, if not crucial. It's really easy to not listen to someone far away, but if you're the main stakeholder at a place, well, people will listen to you if you say something. Um, and also, especially early on in a career, one has the advantage of not too many strings attached. You can say things because they're right and you can help move institutions um, that are big ships that have been around for centuries. Uh, to steer the the way into in, into directions that is right and change the culture um, of being. Eventually, it's it's your institution, it's your home, um, and they probably will listen to you. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, with that, uh, we come to the end of this webinar. So I'd like to thank um, all our speakers um, and uh, uh, Naomi and um, uh, Anya for helping with the back end uh, and uh, to everyone who tuned in today and contributed to this discussion and also if you're asynchronously joining us on YouTube please uh, leave us uh, your cool initiatives and comments and uh, it was also a wonderful opportunity to learn more about your initiatives on how we can improve both training and research uh, culture at institutional level and also at the global level. Um, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, and our next uh, ECI Wednesday webinar will be held on uh, May 27th. Uh, and uh, we'll be discussing uh, improving conferences. I hope to see you then. And uh, have a great day. Uh, stay at home. Thank you. <laughs>